Yay, Francis. We, re we enjoyed Roberta last week, but we're glad you're back. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here today. And um, those of you that are online, and we uh, welcome you as well. We're glad that you can join us um, wherever you are. Um, I'd like to, uh, to say that, you know, Kristen that was here last week that uh, shared with us about LifeSpring and Transitional Housing and Drop-In Center, she gave us brochures. So if you'd like more information um, to take home and, and understand that incredible ministry going on right here in Vista, just a few blocks from us, um, pick up the brochures. They're available outside on a table, and um, there's plenty for everyone. Got some sad news. Um, a long-term member of our congregation, Ken Dixon, passed away on Friday. And so be in prayers for um, Lucy and, um, and their family, um, Kevin and Belinda. And then so, um, you know, um, he had a valiant uh, struggle uh, and uh, battle against cancer. But now he's home and he's, he's free of that. Linda says, and Kevin also, that uh, they plan a memorial service here at, at Grace uh, in the future. We just don't know when that'll be at this point. So keep them in your prayers. Um, after worship, we have a time of, uh, uh, of uh, out in the patio, as uh, Wayne likes to say, uh, overtime <laughs> uh, for refreshments. We invite you all to come out and uh, spend some time with each other and get to know each other because we have a baptism this morning um, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit but uh, you know let's let's uh, gather around uh, together and get to know one another and welcome uh, one another in the name of Christ and also <laughs> Jane has an announcement come on up Jane yeah. I know I know but it, I wasn't thinking about this announcement. I'm known for my subtlety here. Uh, next Sunday, we have to say goodbye to Mike and Joni, but it's not goodbye, it's aloha. So after the service, we are having a good old Presbyterian potluck. We have Santa Maria tri-tip, his favorite, as our main dish. And so... With salsa? I'm not That's in charge of that. No. <laughs> I'm not in charge of that part. <laughs> but we'd love to have you come. If you haven't signed up, of course you're welcome. We're just trying to get numbers so we know how many tables to have. We're going to be out there at overtime, and we'd love to have you stop by. And there's something else we'd like to talk to you about, maybe if you can stop by. Yeah. But we've got to keep some surprises. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, the transition of life and ministries uh, continue, and I'm um, looking forward to retirement, but I'm, I'm not looking forward to not being with, to being with you uh, each Sunday. That's, that's going to take some little transition for me, but um, God is good, and God has his plan, which is so much better than what we would ever um, imagine, right? All right, so let's take a moment to greet those that are seated around us with the right hand of fellowship.
Let's uh, let's begin our worship. Okay. For our call to worship this morning, I want to invite Ed Paradis to come forward. Good morning. <clears throat> a grandmother <laughs> gave me the following verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. Surely we must, he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear. <coughs> the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. <clears throat> Let's see. I, I lost my place. <laughs> um, not, nor the pestilence that stalks the dark, in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys the midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will <clears throat> only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. You will tread upon the lion and trample the great lion and serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. <laughs> I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Heavenly Father, today we lift up to you Justin and Susanna, Wyatt, and Weston, and ask that you empower us to live up to our promise in guiding, in guiding Weston in her journey. We also rejoice with Duane and Sue in the joyous occasion of, this, of their granddaughter's baptism. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ed. That was heartfelt. And we... You know, um, what a great song to begin our worship today. Let's now transition to our hymn, which is um, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, appropriate for a baptism Sunday. And so let's stand and sing this marvelous
Please be seated. This uh, song of uh, confessing our faith, uh, affirming our faith, is called Always. Um, it's, it's a great format. I believe um, you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I you know, so it's, it's a wonderful affirmation of who God is in Christ. Let's sing praises uh, of reminding ourselves of this great fact.
Please be seated. Well, the Lord is faithful. He yesterday, now, and always. And we are gathering to affirm that he is faithful, that he is with us even now, and that he will never leave us or forsake us. There's so much to be thankful for. So let us give thanks to our God. Lord our God, <laughs> we want to give thanks to you. We want to gr be grateful for all your good and perfect gifts given to us on a daily basis and throughout our lifetime especially for Jesus Christ who has come into our life, who has claimed us as his own, who chooses us to be his family. We thank you, Lord, that we are gathered together today, uh, that we can express our gratefulness to you for uh, all your gifts by giving back to you praises, by blessing you with our presence in your house, by blessing you with our, our love and our adoration, by blessing you with our gifts of energy and time and, and resources. So we pray, Lord, that you would bless these gifts, multiply them, that your kingdom can advance in this world, that others who haven't a relationship with you yet might know who you are and, and be drawn to you or be brought to you and, and receive your grace and mercy in Christ. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said,
very inspiring, really. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full of his glorious face. Isn't that what we, we do when we come into worship on Sunday mornings is to, is to look at Jesus, you know, to see and be affirmed again that he loves us, that he challenges us, that he calls us to be his people, not, not only in church, but throughout the, uh, the world, wherever we go between Sundays. And um, it's, it's truly a remarkable moment for us to gather, to be inspired by such wonderful singing and, and songs that we uh, um, have uh, learned over the years. You know, for most of my 43 years of ministry, I've uh, been privileged to participate in some form of children's and youth ministry. Uh, in fact, I started in First Pres Boulder, Colorado as the high school pastor. Prior to that, I was the youth director at, at a couple of Presbyterian churches uh, uh, even before I was ordained. And so I, I always thought that I would be uh, in youth ministry the rest of my life. Well, God had other plans <laughs> um, as he moved me into other areas of ministry. But I've always played a part in some form of, of Christian education with children or camping ministries or youth ministries of some kind throughout my career. Um, Joni, my wife, um, was in ministry for 17 years at uh, North Coast Presbyterian Church and, and uh, uh, North uh, Coast Calvary Chapel. And, you know, um, I've watched her have a heart for youth and children as well as adults, but she left that ministry to be with her grandkids. She felt a calling to go and pour Jesus into her, her grand boys. She's got five of them here locally, so that's a lot of work. And she does it marvelously. She's amazing. And I get to participate in that a little as well. Um, today we're going to participate in a very special moment with a child who has been brought to church and ultimately to Jesus. And we'll celebrate the sacrament of baptism of Weston <coughs> Mackenzie Balke. Uh, it's a moment of promise and hope that one day Weston will give her life to Jesus and, and fulfill God's loving desire that all children will come to Christ, yielding to him as Lord and Savior. Uh, and so uh, all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, contain the story that we're going to be um, um, reading today and, and I'll be teaching on. Uh, so by the fact that all three of those Gospels picked up on this story. I think it's an important story that God wants us to hear and um, to uh, respond to. Now, I chose Mark's uh, rendition of it uh, for today because it was the first one written, and it contains you know, a little insight into to Jesus that I think will really help us. I really believe that grace is going to enter a new season of ministry where families and children will return and the next generation will be equipped for continuing ministry and mission out of the congregation to the community of Vista and beyond. Now this baptism today is a promise that Weston's parents and this congregation make to teach her about God's love in Jesus Christ that one day that she will indeed fulfill the promises that we all make and, uh, to God today. So if you will, turn to Mark chapter 10. Uh, we're going to look at verses 13 through 16. And while you're turning, um, let us open up with prayer on this. Lord our God, we thank you for this moment to reflect on your word, to see the importance of this area of ministry and um, connection and relationship with you. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to receive your word and to apply it to our lives. Um, uh, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the context of Jesus' teaching about um, family and the importance of family and, and uh, connection and relationship with him, there's this little story tucked in here about uh, little children who were brought to Jesus. Hear the word of God. Now people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
Now I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. Isn't that a sweet passage? May God bless to us the reading and the hearing of his word. Now, I, I really love this scene where parents who know that Jesus was very special, and perhaps the Christ that had been promised to come and deliver Israel, uh, they'd seen his mighty works and bringing their young children to Jesus so that, they might, so that he might touch them and, and bless them. This is a truly amazing moment. Commentator Daryl Brock notes that normally in Judaism, such blessings were given by elders and scribes um, on the eve of the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, uh, the day when uh, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies in the temple and uh, uh, confess the sins of the people of Israel um, and the sacrifice uh, of the lamb and the blood that would be spread upon its altar. However, I think... Jesus was delighted all year long to hold a child in his loving arms and place his hand on their head and lift his eyes to heaven and pronounce God's blessing on each child. The parents uh, were bringing their children, I think, for such a blessing. And so the word used for little children would apply to children from very small infants to children up to 12 years of age. Now the verb, were bringing, also communicates the dependence and the smallness of the children. They were brought. They didn't come on their own uh, volition. They were brought to Jesus. They did not come to speak with Jesus on their own. They were brought to him, which shows their innocence. Well, this is a state of all children, no matter what age we are. <laughs> when we are brought to Jesus as infants or young boys and girls. Now the baptism we celebrate today is just such an example. Baby Weston is being brought to Jesus for baptism, not because she has any say in the matter, but because her parents have desired to bring her so that she might be touched by Jesus and blessed in the sacrament of baptism to the end that she is welcomed into the family of God with all of its privileges. Now, scale, uh, scholar Dale Bruner writes and sees the importance of the uh, church to never lose sight of this important ministry. He writes, the reason for bringing the children is to have Jesus touch them and pray for them. And this is still the pr purpose of the church in bringing little children to Jesus. The church believes Jesus capable of doing much for even those members of our community who do not even seem capable of doing much for him. Well, then we read in the second part of verse 13, these words, the disciples rebuke them. <laughs> kind of an interesting contrast, isn't it? Who do they, do they rebuke? They rebuke the parents. Well, why would they do this? Well, perhaps they thought that Jesus was too busy to give time and precious time for children at that moment. Or perhaps they believed the children were too young to understand Jesus and his teaching, and therefore it was a, a waste of his time. In the culture of the Roman Empire at the time, children were regarded as a burden from birth until they became adults. They were to be seen but not heard. Where have we heard that before, right? What makes sense here is the context and the position of this event in Scripture. Jesus was heading towards Jerusalem for the last time before his crucifixion. In fact, the next chapter is the beginning of his entry, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. His last week on earth at, uh, before his crucifixion. Surely, um, the disciples were excited about what was coming and perhaps maybe Jesus would be establishing his earthly kingdom and be, they'll be rid of the Roman uh, occupation that was, was happening and their, their, their nation uh, could be independent once again. Certainly Jesus did not have time, of course, from their point of view, to be attentive to helpless children who would 
not help the, see, the cause. However, what they didn't know is that Jesus gives just as much value to children as he does to adults. He wants to bring both to salvation. And all who are lowly and helpless, the apostles, or, or this applies uh, to all facets of ministry, with children, of course. And in baptism, we believe Christ's own word and deed are present in the faith of others to create personal faith in those who are brought to him, even those who are the smallest children. Miracles of faith happen with Jesus, don't they? Well, it is one of the loveliest things in all the gospel story that Jesus had time for children, even when he was on the way to Jerusalem to be crucified. However, Jesus deeply disagreed with the behavior of the disciples. In fact, the text says when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. Well, becoming indignant means that Jesus' anger was aroused and he expressed his displeasure in uh, their behavior at that moment. And we get an insight of, here of Jesus' compassion and defense of the helpless, the vulnerable, and the powerless. How often does Jesus have to rebuke his followers who stand in the way of, uh, of deprived people who desire to come to him or bring others? I can't tell you how often in my 43-year career as a pastor that I've witnessed the subtle obstacles of well-meaning church people, including myself, that we've put up that hinder the accessibility of Jesus to the powerless, to the needy, to the vulnerable, to those who need it most. Well, most of the time, we don't even know that we're doing it because it's disguised as expected manners in church or minimized because there is no immediate benefit to the church. Unfortunately, we all are subject to such thinking from our Western worldview and cultural programming. My children, when they were in elementary school, were typical children with typical attention spans and fidgety behavior while sitting for an hour in, church, in a church pew when, uh, in worship and not in Sunday school. Have you ever had a child in church? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, occasionally I'd see or hear about other Older adults sitting near them, turning and glaring at them and doing what? Shh. <laughs> right? Well, the problem with this is that it may be a negative or hurtful barrier to Jesus. I had to process on numerous occasions with my children and help them understand that they weren't in danger, but that these well-meaning people were programmed by many years um, that children should be quiet in church and not a distraction, right? So I've worked with a few congregations to help them understand that if we want young families and children to come to church, guess what we need to do? We need to be patient and kind to allow the noises and the fidgetiness and the motions and the confusions and the dancing and the whatever the children are doing in worship because they're here, right? They may get fingerprints on the wall. Who cares? They're here. They might damage something and break it, but they're here. What's more important, right? So this goes for those adults who are, are not Christians yet as well. We can't expect their behaviors to be as considerate and kind and appropriate as those of us that have been filled with the Holy Spirit for many years, and our, our behaviors have transformed, and we've moved into the church's expectations of being quiet and listening and caring and kind, but we can't expect that of those who don't have those parameters already, right? So let's monitor what we do and say that it might not hinder little children of whatever age they are from coming to Jesus. Well, Jesus then states that say, after saying not to hinder the children, 
Uh, he says, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, Jesus wanted his disciples and the children's parents to know that children are candidates for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is something we all look forward to in, etern as in eternity, a kingdom of righteousness and peace where death has been defeated and, and a new heaven and a new earth has been established for the people of God to dwell in. We all look forward to that. However, until then, we experience the kingdom of God now where Jesus is present, where the power of God is experienced through his people. We're the body of Christ in this world. And wherever the body of Christ goes, the kingdom is going to be present with us. As we're loving, as we're caring, as we're giving, as we're laying our hands on people to pray for their healing, as we're, these are moments where the kingdom of God has come near because we're the ambassadors of Christ. We bring Christ present into the community. But wherever there is God-like love expressed, wherever people are served and the miracles of God are evident, we experience a glimpse of God's reign and power, his rule in this world. God's future kingdom touching us now. Now in seminary and in theological books, um, we call this realized eschatology. So I've given you in a, a, a 10 cent uh, uh, phrase that you can really impress people. Oh, yeah, that's realized eschatology. <laughs> well, eschatology means the study of the end times. Realized means you've, you've, it's, it's known, it's, it's here now, right? So that's what that refers to. But my seminary professor, George Ladd, who wrote extensively on this subject, used to say in class, we live in the presence of the future. We live in the presence of the future. Whatever we experience, God's reign and rule in our life today. What Jesus is teaching his disciples in this passage is that children are welcomed into the kingdom of God. In fact, they are the most likely candidates. We should never hinder them from entering God's kingdom. So in addition to their childlike faith, Jesus is teaching here that it's more about their vulnerability and their helplessness. It's uh, and all those who recognize it and are humble enough to see that they are not capable to come to Jesus on their own merits, they, um, they come to Jesus on the merits of God. They come because it's more about what God has done for them through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's more about his love that welcomes us. That's why he also says, I tell you the truth, anyone who will receive the kingdom of God like a child, little child, will never enter it. Um, so when the helpless come to Jesus, they come to the kingdom of God. And Jesus quietly and unobtrusively but definitely identifies coming to him as equivalent to coming to the kingdom. So the kingdom of God is made up of those who are dependent, Unable, weak, vulnerable, helpless people because they know that nothing that they can do will ever qualify them for salvation. It's all about what God has done on our behalf. Any person who prides themselves with what they have done for God in this life and therefore uh, think that they have earned salvation will be disappointed in the end. Jesus taught that some on Judgment Day will protest giving examples of their good deeds, and, and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Duh. Jesus wants our hearts. He wants a relationship with us. And we know that without his work of love for us, we are powerless to be saved. It's all about what God has done for everyone who will receive what he has done for them. Remember, Scholar Dallas Willard once said, heaven's not going to be populated with those who don't want to be there. <laughs> so you might as well start wanting to be with Jesus and getting used to what it's going to be like in heaven because when you get there, you're going to want to be there, right? And we do that because God wants us there. 
God has made it possible for us in Christ. Well, lastly, Jesus acts on the request of the parents. In verse 16, he writes, or Mark writes, and he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Now, I love this description of Jesus' actions. Uh, he did more than was originally asked for by the parents. They only asked him if he would touch their children, but Mark reports that Jesus took the children in his arms. Was that a hug that he gave to them? Put his hands on them. Was that laying his hands on top of their head to bless them? Here we get a glimpse of Jesus' kingdom authority at work and how the kingdom of God came near to these people that day, and especially the children that were brought to him. So note that the ministry of Jesus touching people throughout the Gospels is prominently written about. There's something very important about the act of lovingly touching others. He touched the lepers and healed them because they were deprived of human touch and were considered unclean and contagious and you don't want to get near them. And he touched the blind and the deaf and the lame and the dead, healing and resurrecting and all of this to demonstrate God's kingdom power, signs and wonders, mercy and love. Now here, Jesus not only touched, but he hugged the children. There is love communicated through these actions that be, that's beyond words. I read in Forbes magazine uh, in August of 2020, contributing writer Christine Comford wrote about the need for hugs, and she quoted Virginia Setter, uh, a world-renowned family therapist, who is famous for saying these words. She says that we need four hugs a day for survival. We need eight hugs a day, eight, eight hugs a day for maintenance, and we need 12 hugs a day for growth. That's a lot of hugs. Are we getting the minimal requirement of hugs every day? Diane says, yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs> well, that's a lot of hugging. I think I need to get more grandkids around. We all know the power of a hug and a gentle touch. Unfortunately, in our society in recent years, people have been isolated from family and friends where they can't get the affirming value and love that they would have gotten it if COVID had not pushed us into quarantine. You just can't get the same experience online or on FaceTime, can you? Thank God for that much, but the, the, the moment of being able to hold a grandchild in your arms or a child or, or someone close to you, to be hugged by them, to know, of course, uh, that you are loved and affirmed. Our world um, needs to be careful today, of course, because of uh, and be sensitive to people when we try to hug them or touch them because they've been abused. There's so much abuse going on, and we need to be careful um, not to impose that on others in our world. Unless, So it's important to ask, can I hug you? Can I, you know, uh, and to be careful about that. It's unfortunate that we have to do that, right? But it's the context of our world today. However, to maintain our sanity and self-worth, Jesus, of course, calls us to be close to one another, to affirm one another in love and care. And he touched and hugged appropriately on a daily basis. We need that for our sanity and for our self-worth. So many of us at Grace are, are comfortable with hugging others and in our default, um, we'll want, you know, walk up to people and hug them, but we've got to be careful. Please let us know if you're somebody that's not comfortable with being hugged so that we don't violate what's comfort, your comfort zone and uh, where you need time to build uh, trust and acceptance. But on the other hand, let's not forget the importance of touching and hugging for those who are comfortable with it. Well, the third action was a, a blessing from Jesus upon each child. 
The Bible's full of accounts where God blesses people with their needs. Um, and in our text, Jesus blessed the children with affirmation that they were loved and welcomed by God into the kingdom. Now, he could have used the priestly blessing so common at the time. Do you remember that from number six? Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he um, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. You hear that from pastors a lot during the benediction, the blessing at the end of worship service. Whether you use that or whether you used another one is not important, but the idea is that Jesus, God in the flesh, was blessing the children. Now, whether they understood it totally then is not important. They felt it in that moment, and that seed of blessing, I'm sure, grew within them to understanding later. For most of us, our parents lived and loved in such a way that the blessing was imparted through their actions and words. We grew up affirmed that we were loved and our self-esteem was, was healthy. Some adults never received a blessing and our psychologist's offices are filled with people who struggle with the ramifications of not inheriting or receiving that blessing from their parents. Gary Smalley and John Trent wrote the book called The Blessing. I don't know if you've read, read it. It's, it's a great book that talks about how important it is for parents to pass on the blessing to their children. They wrote these words, affirming words from moms and dads are like light switches. Speak a word of affirmation at the right moment in a child's life, and it's, the, it's like lighting up a whole room full of possibility. So important a responsibility for parents and grandparents to speak words of affirmation to children and grandchildren, great grandchildren, for some of you. Know that the blessings that Jesus gives little children is also what he gives to each person that's brought to him. When Jesus is present with us in any context, in any place, we are blessed because we know that God's aff affirming his love for us. Presbyterian uh, pastor and author Lloyd John Ogilvie from First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. Maybe some of you uh, were there in some of those worship services under his ministry, or maybe you saw him on TV, or maybe you've read some of his books. He writes, to be a blessed person is to know, feel, and relish God's affirmation and assurance, acceptance, and approval. It is the experience of being chosen and cherished, valued, and enjoyed. Early in my ministry, I was rummaging around in a church Sunday school room when I came across an old flip chart of paintings depicting various biblical stories, and I had never seen this before, so I asked, what, was this, what were these paintings about? And somebody informed me that they were part of a Bible study um, uh, called Bethel Bible Series. Anybody here go through the Bethel Bible Series at some point way back when? Yeah, a few of you. Um, the main theme of the series was taken from God's covenant with, with Abraham. Do you remember that main theme? Anybody want to? Blessed to be a blessing. Yes, Judy, thank you. And in other words, God blesses his people to empower them to bless others. Now, Grace is entering a new season of ministry and mission. You have been blessed with people and resources, a beautiful facility, talented music people to enhance worship, and now you're being blessed with a new pastor and his family that are coming in two weeks. You've had a great history of proclaiming God's love and salvation in the community of Vista, welcoming all into this congregation. Now it's time to allow God to bless those who are young and helpless in their ability to even know that they need salvation in Christ. And it's time to identify any barriers that keep people from coming to Christ and remove those obstacles. It's time to be God's blessing on the children of all ages in this community. It's time to give sacrificially of your energy and resources to support God's plan to bless North County and God's kingdom rule and reign 
through Grace Presbyterian Church. Now, if grace is going to thrive, if grace is going to grow with new families who feel welcomed by Christ, then grace will need to step up on the, to the plate and provide what's needed since you have already been blessed with all that you need to move forward in this ministry to thrive. Today's baptism is only a beginning of God's blessing for a new future at Grace Presbyterian Church. God has great plans for his congregation and for the church in general, and you have been called to participate in a powerful movement to transform hearts and minds with the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you hear me? Do you hear God in that? There is a, a new future for grace that's going to be remarkable going forward. This is the moment. This is the time. Amen. Let us pray. Well, Lord our God, it's pretty exciting to be at this moment in the life of Grace Presbyterian Church, to be at this moment in our relationship with you, to be challenged, to be encouraged, to be inspired, to step up our ministry, to step up our resources, that we support um, this new pastor and his family, that we support the ministries of this congregation through our time, our energy, our, our money. Lord, we pray, thanksgivings, that you called us to be part of this new adventure. We're grateful, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is with us and that your blessings are with us and that there is nothing you're calling us to do that you haven't already given. We thank you, Lord, for children. Our community is so full of children that don't know you, and so we pray, Lord, for opportunity to build bridges and to, you know, relationships with, with parents that could bring children to be introduced to you through this ministry. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to move on the hearts and minds of those around us that they'll be driving down East Vista Way and maybe just supernaturally turn in the driveway one day and come visit because they know that you have brought them that you have chosen them. So, Lord, we thank you for the saints of this congregation in the past, for its past pastors and, and elders and deacons and members that have brought us to this moment so faithfully dedicated to you. We thank you, Lord, um, for the legacy that they have left now is entrusted to this congregation, this time, and this effort moving forward is now the blessing that we get to share with others. We pray, Lord, for the Dixon family and the passing of our dear friend Ken, and we pray, God, for uh, Lucy especially as she's lost her husband uh, for this time and um, I know grief is going to be very strong and, and, and tough to go through. We pray for Kevin and his wife, Belinda, and their family, and all friends and, and, and extended family of the Dixons. And thank you, Lord, for Ken's faithfulness and his dedication to you and um, his faith in you. And so, Lord, we, we pray um, knowing that he is with you now and it is probably... Um, you know, um, receiving well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy that you, uh, that I have prepared for you. Thank you, Lord, uh, for um, the reminder of Ken's life and for his um, faithfulness to you and your love for him. We know where he is, and we're grateful for that. We pray, Lord, for our country. We pray, God, for its division that is, is 
so radical these days, and we pray, God, for your spirit to move across our nation and unite it once again. And we pray, God, for especially people to come to you and to be united in you, and united in love and united in peace and united in, in, in the, with the same mind that is in Christ. Pray, Lord, also for the conflict, the war in Europe, in the Ukraine. And we pray, God, for an, an end to the violence, an end to this, this, this war that is with so many atrocities uh, that are taking place. So many people have, have been displaced and, and are grieving the loss of loved ones property and so many things, Lord, that we can't even imagine. We pray, Lord, for your intervention. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so let's stand and sing um, uh, a hymn number 44, Children of the Heavenly Father, as we prepare for the sacrament of baptism. <laughs> Well, this is a special time in the life of the church. And little Weston is just focused on me for some reason. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah, I had smiles and everything while we were singing that hymn. Um, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here are also these words from Scripture. The promise is for you, for your children and all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. So obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, 
God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. So let us remember with joy our own baptism this morning as we, cre as we celebrate this sacrament. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Good morning, church. On behalf of the session, and we've got a number of family and friends that are here, um, Barbara Nicholson, great-grandma, also known as Gigi, uh, Dan and Jan Bauke, all the way here from Colorado, uh, aunts and uncles, and great aunts and uncles. And also, I'd like to uh, especially thank uh, Bev Bush. Um, 50 years ago, or thereabouts, uh, Bev brought me to this church along with her boys. And a few years later, uh, I, I too was baptized by Pastor John Chambers. And <clears throat> so this has come full circle to, uh, to be able to uh, baptize uh, some of my grandchildren here. So on, uh, on behalf of the session here at Grace Church, I present Weston Mackenzie Bauke, the daughter of Susanna and Justin Bauke, to receive the sacrament of baptism. All right, well, come on up. Just stand right over here. And I'm going to invite any family members that want to come and gather around us. You can stand on these stairs right behind us and, and be able to see. Um, we want to keep it open for the congregation to be able to to have visibility of what's going on as well. Isn't she cute? Um, do you have any sponsors or godparents or anything that you've designated? Just all of them. All of everybody, okay. <laughs> all right then. Um, we're going to start with a profession of faith. Through baptism, we enter the covenant uh, God has established. And within the covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you with the covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Justin, come on around over here a little bit. <laughs> okay. um, so, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and power in the world? And do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in the grace and love? And will you in Christ's faithful, be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, do, you, do you renounce evil and the powers of... Oh, I already said that one, didn't I? Okay, so we... Can, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, and with the whole church, let us confess our, our faith in God. So let's stand and repeat the Apostles' Creed, which is on the screen behind you. Um, folks, if you'd like to turn and let us begin together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So the Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right to give our thanks to him praise. Eternal and gracious God, we give thanks in countless ways uh, for how you have revealed yourself in past ages and have blessed us with the signs of your grace. Amen. So, as we pour this water, we're reminded of how God has used water in so many ways throughout the ages. He not only created water, but he's blessed his people through the waters of, um, of, of, of what's the word I'm looking for, of deliverance. <laughs> um, uh, as he's brought his people out of Egypt and into the promised land. He's used water to baptize, symbolizing cleansing and, and new life uh, as we die to sin and raise up in Christ um, a new people. The old things have passed away, new things have come. So let us pray. We praise you, and through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by our Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you that in baptism, you gave us your Holy Spirit, who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. Pour out your spirit upon us and upon this water that this font may be your womb of new birth. May she who is about to pass through these waters be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind her to the household of faith. Guard her with, from all evil. Strengthen her to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. To you be all praise and honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Savior, who with you and with the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Weston McKenzie Balke, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend on your heart, and into your life, and bless you for eternity in Christ. Amen. Go. He seems to. I want to introduce you all <laughs> to Weston McKenzie Falke. Isn't she precious? She is so sweet, and she's being really good. The newest member of the Kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And she's, she is enthralled by you all. <laughs> and she, and all that's going on. Just look at all these people. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. He's precious. You guys are going to promise to raise her in the admonition of Christ. You know, you guys are promising today on behalf of the body of Christ to... <laughs> To, um, to pray for her, to support whatever education she needs, whatever 
connection she needs to to stay within <laughs> this loving family of believers called the church where God is present and where she might also contribute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've been really good. <laughs> okay. Come on up here. <laughs> I'll hand her off to you guys right now. But we, we're not done yet. <laughs> Come on over here. <clears throat> i got to find my place. So, Weston, we want to welcome you into this new life, into this family of believers in faith. And we promise today to do all in our powers to pray for you and to raise you, knowing Jesus Christ, knowing the love of God. Yeah, <laughs> you got a smile for that one. She's going, yes. <laughs> See the book? <laughs> yeah. You want to see the book? Yeah, right there. <laughs> um, so with joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ Church to share with us in the ministry as you grow and mature in him. For we all are one in Christ, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Everlasting God, in your mercy, you promised to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you for receiving Weston in baptism. Keep her always in your love. Guide her as, as she grows in faith and protect her uh, in all the dangers and temptations of life. Bring her to confess Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and be faithful disciple uh, to her life's end in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. A lot going on today. Um, and what a wonderful day to celebrate um, a new, the newest member of, the, of uh, God's kingdom and his covenant uh, that he's given to us. So cute. <laughs> All right. So let's stand and sing uh, Your Grace is Enough. And there's a line in here uh, in the pre-chorus that says, So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Let's praise God. <laughs> So remember your name. 
His grace is enough, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. Well, um, if you're here today, you weren't here by accident. Uh, God has been speaking, and I hope you've been hearing and responding to uh, what he's had to say to our hearts. Such an important message for us to hear. And so, um, uh, and then to participate in this wonderful celebration sacrament of uh, Weston McKenzie's uh, uh, baptism. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.